Today, I am very happy to introduce Garth Risk Kalberg. You may know him for his much talk about debut novel, City on Fire, for which he garnered critical praise, including being named as one of 2015's best books by the Washington Post and NPR. He's also a two-time finalist for the National Books Critics Circle's Nona Balakian Citation for Excellence in Reviewing. Um, in 2017, he was named one of Granta's Best Young American Novelists. His work has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times Book Review and The Guardian. His new book is A Field Guide to the North American Family. It is a novella, yes, but calling it just that would be an oversimplification. For those who have not read it yet, I would describe it as a choose-your-own-adventure story written by John Cheever or Raymond Carver. Um, it, it is amazing, inventive, and ambitious. Uh, trust me, I've read the novel. I love it. It is everything that fiction should be. It is a story of two families who are doing their best trying to fulfill the American dream told in 63 disjointed vignettes. Kirkus Reviews in the review of the book has said that Halberg has a fine novelist's grace and sensitivity. And Rivka Galchin, author of Atmospheric Disturbances, said that a field guide to the North American family reads like magic, like a private book of spells meant to keep away all the things that have already happened. Each word and image matters. It's a gorgeous labyrinth of a book. I wholeheartedly agree with both sentiments. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Garth Rix Calvert. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks, everyone, for spending a little bit of your uh, Sunday here at the bookstore. It's always wonderful around uh, the holidays to come in to the bookstores on the weekend and see how uh, lively and thriving they are, despite the, you know, the much-rumored death of reading, it seems to be had to have miraculously survived 2017. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, and it's, uh, this is one of my favorite bookstores. Um, I remember sitting where you are and watching Joan Didion do this, you know, and um, so it's a great honor to, to be up here all these years later. Um, <clears throat> this, this book was, uh, was actually written during a portion of my misspent youth, uh, which I misspent here in Washington, which I'm happy to talk about. <laughs> afterward. Um, but uh, as Bernard mentioned in his warm introduction, um, it's sort of uh, structured like these choose your own adventure books that I loved when I was a kid. So you have these sort of fairly short chapters and you can read them straight through or I've kind of provided some options for for jumping around. Um, and another thing um, to mention is that it is illustrated um, with photographs. So each chapter corresponds to a photograph. So I've put together a little slideshow that will play while I'm reading so that you can kind of get a feel for the images as well as for the, the text. And um, uh, the last time I, I did this, and we had an AV snafu, I had my um, gray-bearded friend, Ron, hold up the book like this while I was reading. Um, and I referred to him as my lovely assistant. But I, I think in, in this context, that would be condescending and wrong. So I will just say my assistant <laughs> here <laughs> will advance the, uh, the slides when I, when I give the high sign. So you can advance one. So this is, um, this is the, these are the family trees of the two families who are uh, the principal concern here. One is the Hungates and one is the Harrisons. And they're next door neighbors living uh, on the North Shore of Long Island, and they have two, um, each has two kids, and the older kids are the same age, the younger are a little spaced apart, but through that experience, they've, they've sort of um, grown close, and the kind of trigger for the plot of the book is that one of these families has a tragedy, and the book sort of traces the ramifications thereof. Um, and I will also mention that the chapters appear alphabetically. So the first one is called Adolescence. It's the bolt cutters that open up a hole in the storm fence just big enough for a skinny boy to slip through. It's the backpack in which spray cans are rattling. One knows what one is doing, weaving back and forth among the dark hulks of train cars, 
It's the rails one must be careful to avoid. It's the memory of batteries blown up in earlier, smaller instances of life beyond, beyond the law. Or beyond the row of junked cars, the newer ones the mayor has pronounced paint resistant. It's the rush of blood in the ears, the image on the backs of the eyes. It's the sky over the city, sprayed violet, like the inside of one's heart, cloudy, brooding, still aglow after distant explosions. Adulthood. Funerals weren't so different from elementary school. There were rules you learned sooner or later, the easy way or the hard way. Sit still, listen, offer your wife or daughter a hand to hold, as though holding hands were something your family still did. Squeeze to signify you might cry at what seemed to be the appropriate moments. If you think you might actually cry, wear sunglasses. It was grim but true, like school and work and everything else in Jack Hungate's life, the funeral had eventually lost its novelty and become just another thing to plug into the day planner. And by the end of his 40s, he was averaging one or two every year, co-workers, fraternity brothers, relatives he'd forgotten he had, neighbors. The sun was shining on the day that committed Frank Harrison to the earth, for example. And as Jack gazed through tinted lenses at the glowing blonde hair on his own wife's and daughter's heads and at his son's nascent sideburns, he realized he'd never really known the man, despite having seen him at least once a week for the last decade, a total of hundreds of neighborly interactions. Several times each summer, Frank had brought his family over to barbecue and swim. Their kids were the same age, roughly. A memory floated up out of the haze, Frank Harrison emerging from the backyard pool, half naked and hulking, his booming voice advertising his kingdom for a towel and a beer. And it dawned on Jack that it could just as easily have been his own blood vessels bursting. It could have been his heart. He struggled to remain somber. He looked out across the sea of stricken faces toward the faraway silver sound. Incense was on the air. An eerie silence obtained as after snowfall, broken only by the priest's litany and the drone of incoming planes and the widow's choked breathing. It could have been me, Jack thought, but it wasn't. A month later, when he and Elizabeth separated, he would find himself cursing the empty decorum of the country club set. But it served him well that day. No one could tell that inside he was rejoicing, or that, although his heart now went out to Marnie and the two Harrison kids, Lacey and, what's his name, Tommy, he'd never really cared for the dead man anyway. Boredom. Jackie roams the near-empty lower field with a handheld video camera, chasing the electrons in the broody gray air, the mist so fine it might be imaginary. Brake lights stream beyond the chain link fence. On the next field over, the varsity football team is practicing, and the war chants of teenagers puncture the pressurized quiet. A flock of gray-white birds is flushed from the hedge that separates the two fields. She chases them, her ponytail whipping around, her skirt and shirt too thin for the weather. She is narrating. Today I lost a tooth. She captures the birds as they tumble in a dizzying fractal into the air, color shifting light to dark. They churn over a swimming pool that's been covered for winter and dwindle to dots in the sky. They're running away. They don't like me, Jackie says. Trees scatter in the lens as she gallops away from the bushes. The grass is brown. She spots a mud puddle. This is from when the trucks come across the field for a delivery. Now she lies down in the dry grass and aims the camera toward her face. This is what it's like to be a bug. Not very exciting. She turns the camera around and positions her stuffed lion in front of the lens. 
It flops over. She reaches out to make an adjustment, but it flops again. An empty sandbox forms a backdrop. This is Alphonse, she says. Say hello, Alphonse. Hello. Behind him, that's the sandbox where I played at lunch today. I made a castle. Tomorrow I'm going to play kickball. That's my video journal for today, the end. The microphone drones dimly with white noise and the camera continues to run, capturing the sandbox and the procession of blurry taillights far behind the flopped lion whose mane is accreting fine raindrops. The voice cuts in again. Owen, oh, also today, my parents got divorced. The end. The footage ends abruptly. Chemistry. Sugar. Sweet and low. Caffeine to start the day. To unwind alcohol, a beer or two, a glass of wine, sherry or gin or a dry martini, by the chair, by the pool, a glass or a bottle. Then Tylenol, or for headaches, ibuprofen, for asthma, albuterol, sniffles, sneezes, postnasal drip, Robitussin, NyQuil, Dimetap. The pantheon of brand name pharmaceuticals, like poets of a dead tongue. Valium, Lithium, Xanax, and Zoloft, Paxil, and Prozac. Allegra, Viagra, Claritin, Clarinex, Retsin, and Ritalin. The shelf in the medicine chest stuffed with Eli Lilly, GlaxoSmithKline, AstraZeneca. The horizons huffing opens up. Gasoline, whipped cream, permanent markers, airplane glue, and airbrush propellant. And then nicotine, marijuana, hashish, opium, amyl nitrates, lysergic acid, diethylamide, psilocybin, mescaline, methamphetamines and amphetamines, cocaine to kill pain, no different than a codeine pill, no different than Demerol or Percocet. The baby aspirin doctors recommend most. The epidural, even before the birth. Commitment. At first, the black lady behind the desk said visiting hours were over. I could understand where she was coming from. She could have lost her job for breaking hospital regulations. So I tried to keep smiling because I didn't want her to feel bad about what was, after all, just doing her job. But like my dad used to say, back when he was still alive, I have a lousy poker face. And after a few seconds, she sighed. All right, tell me what's going on. Her face was businesslike, but her eyes were kind. I noticed, and it just started spilling out of me about cheerleading running over and Tommy being late with the car and how it would be so hard for me to get across town to the hospital by eight on Tuesdays and Thursdays to see my boyfriend, the patient. She asked his name and I told her, Hungate, Gabriel. She found his chart and studied it for a minute. Like the Archangel, she said, pronouncing the H. Then she told me that she was in charge on weeknights and, so long as I didn't tell anyone, she'd take me back to see him whenever I could get there. That's how I started going every night to the burn unit. It was kind of nice, actually, after all the visitors were gone, even his family, and it could be just him and me. I could talk to him and read to him and sometimes just sit quietly with my hand resting on his one unbandaged hand and try to feel him talking to me through his skin. I could cry and nobody would know. That's another thing my dad had told me. I led a charmed life. Everything would always work out for me. His voice was staticky when he said it. We must have had a bad connection. And on Christmas Eve morning, I made sugar cookies from scratch. It started snowing as I drove over to the hospital to leave them at the front desk for the nurse who'd bent the rules for me. It turned out she was on vacation, still, I left them for whoever was scheduled to work that night. Custody battle. When your house is never clean enough, when your food is never healthy enough, when you're perpetually five to 15 minutes late to meet them in the parking lot of Ken's Big Boy, the neutral zone where your estranged wife insists you meet to exchange your daughter on Wednesdays and alternating weekends. Her Volvo, formerly yours, will be waiting, the sun on the windshield obscuring the passengers within. She always leaves the engine running these days, as if to underscore the point. You're not on time, 
and she has places to be. Your daughter will adopt these grievances as her own, but they will retain the familiar tang of Elizabeth, like the pillowcase that still smells of her shampoo, like the photos in the yearbooks you left behind when you moved out. Discretion. She would never say who, and there were times when Jack wondered whether knowing his identity would have made it better or worse. Afternoons that first fall, when he sat on the back porch with a Schaefer and a cigarette, ready to hide the ladder at the first hint of a car pulling into the drive. False alarms were constant. He would stub out the butt halfway through, only to gather from the unbroken silence of the house behind him that the engine whine he'd heard heralded the arrival of one of his new neighbors and not his son. He'd given Gabe a little used geo for his 17th birthday back in September when he and Elizabeth were still wavering about the separation like the last two leaves on a branch, as though there was anything to do but give in to gravity. Now he wondered if this wasn't part of what kept Gabe coming back, some obscure sense of obligation. Certainly Jackie had added the car to an already formidable dossier of evidence that her father favored his firstborn. The scent of tobacco that hovered around Gabe when he appeared in the afternoons after school made Jack pretty sure that his son was secretly a smoker too. But what could he say? Besides, it almost made him feel closer to the boy. And perhaps Gabe made the crosstown trip so often, far more than the custody agreement stipulated, just to have an excuse to be in the car alone, where he could smoke in private. Jackie never visited anymore. In this way and in most others, she and her brother offset each other. Jack scanned the new backyard. Maybe he would build a wall here that Gabe could paint on, as Elizabeth had reportedly done. The sky, hemmed in by the evergreens at the edges of the backyard, was gray and had been for weeks. The grass was getting crispy. The wind that gusted up and rattled the wind chimes was nothing like it used to be off the bay. At the old house, he couldn't have gotten a cigarette lit. He decided he would have felt better knowing if it had been Martin Luther King, and worse if it had been Jack Kennedy. Better if it was Eric Clapton, and worse if it was Peter Frampton. Better knowing if it was over, worse if it was still going on. Better knowing if it was a complete stranger. Otherwise, better to remain in the dark. Entertainment. In the beginning was the television. And the television was large and paneled in plastic, made to look like wood. It dwelled in a dim corner of the living room and came on for national news, Cosby, Saturday cartoons, and football, and man and woman huddled close on the sofa or stretched out on the rug, and it was good. When man made partner, they bought a VCR, and soon afterward another television, and they began to watch videos together in the darkness, and there was popcorn. In the fifth year, the cable company created the premium channel package, and it was affordable, and woman had moved up in the mayor's office, and so they said, why not? After days of toil to sit and feast in front of the television and not to have to think of something to say was for man and woman a kind of heaven. And then Nintendo said, let there be Duck Hunt, let there be Mario Brothers, let there be Nintendo 64 and GameCube, and the children saw that these were good, though to watch and play at once was not possible. Thus was there purchased a children's television, and unto it was given its own room. And thus did the furnished basement come to be a refuge for daughter and son, when the silence upstairs ended and the fighting began. Where once they had sat together squabbling over the controllers, they now took turns occupying the room alone, turning up the sound to drown out the voices through the floorboards and save for the screen's blue light, darkness 
was on the faces of the children. And one more. Gravity. The garage is where it first happened. He was supposed to clean it out for like $10 or something. My mom had sent me over to borrow an edge trimmer, and Mrs. Hungate told me to go into the garage and ask him to help me find it. At first, I couldn't see him. It was dim in there with the single bulb and all. Even though it was the kind of garage with windows, it was a gray day outside at the end of August. I remember there was a tennis ball strung from the ceiling like a hangman, kind of creepy. Then I heard this clackety-clack sound from the other side of the car. I walked around the rear bumper and saw him squatting there on the concrete pad, arranging aerosol cans in a milk crate. He jumped a little at the sound of his name. He was like, do you want something? And I told him about the edge trimmer. He softened after that. I guess I had just scared him. We were 17 and hadn't talked in forever since the time I pushed him into the pool for trying to give me a wedgie, or at least in the year since my dad had died. Gabe was a foot taller than he'd been back when I had had my crush on him, and something else, more secretive, I guess, quieter. He got the edge trimmer out from wherever it was and put it in my hand and said, anything else? I think it was raining outside. I told him I was sorry about his parents. He stared at me like he might slap me. I'd rather not talk about it, he said. I told him I had been there. Boy, had I. But when I apologized, he said, don't be sorry. Next thing, I'm sitting on the hood of his mom's Volvo with his waist in between my knees and we're kissing. I had kissed boys before, but not like that. Not like fighting and kissing at the same time with our belt buckles scraping together. When I said I'd better go, what I meant was, tell me to stay, but he didn't. I spent a couple weeks in agony before he called me on the phone and said, so what are you doing? Habits, bad. You'll see them first thing in the morning, like dew on the lawns, and last thing at night in the gaps where the motion sensors won't detect them. They believe they're invisible like this in the shadows, but if you study the postures of the figures hunched on front stoops and in bathroom windows by box fans and slumped in lawn chairs out back, you will recognize congressmen, judges, PTA chairs, pillars of the community, sometimes even your own parents or children, the secret smokers. Each cigarette is a stitch binding their lives more tightly together. The cigarette's jack sneaks behind the modest bungalow literally on the other side of the tracks from the old place on the water. The cigarettes that drove Frank's blood pressure up by imperceptible degrees. The cigarettes Gabe chain smokes on his long nocturnal drives to wherever it is he disappears to. The ones Lacey smells on his breath that make her want to ask him to choose her or Philip Morris, even as she leans in for another kiss. Habits good. There is no such thing as a good habit. Love. You'd seen him when they wheeled him in. You would have said 48 hours to maybe 72 at the outside. Even under the sheet on the gurney, you could tell from the way the fluids had begun to seep, like the way grease from a cheesesteak will turn the bag almost clear where it soaks through. Anytime you're talking about second or third degree, you're talking about a lot of fluid loss. That's the major danger. Think of a piece of meat that's been overcooked. That's all we are, really. Now you have Dr. Ross running around like the Queen of Spain because her case study is coming out in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And I'll give her credit for pioneering the technique. There's some who won't, but what do I know about it? But there's a big difference between keeping someone from dying and giving them a reason to live. And since that seems to be the point of your question, let me just mention his family and that little cheerleader who made the cookies. They were there every day when I came on, and she was there when I went off. Maternal instinct. There's a plywood wall six feet high by ten wide in the backyard of the house occupied by Elizabeth and Jackie and, until recently, on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and every other weekend anyway, Gabe. 
Elizabeth had it built, and whatever happens to him will never have it removed, because it is not hers to remove. Moisture off the sound and extreme temperatures have faded the paint and warped the wood until it curls at the edges like paper. The figures, though, are still visible. Faces, flags, birds, bodies, whirls, and jags, and the name he chose to represent him, Casper, written over and over. Repetition is how he'd learned. She'd heard the bass booming from behind the closed door of his room. She'd seen the way he'd abandoned the game cube, the way he stooped over his sketch pad, and she'd figured at least he wasn't on drugs, as Marnie Harrison claimed half the kids at the high school were. She'd figured better under her own figurative roof than out somewhere doing God knows what, like Marnie's son. Gabe didn't have to thank her. The light in his face as he practiced his, what did he call them, his throw-ups, his burners, was enough. Midlife crisis. One of those backyard barbecues toward the end of summer, a season of shortening days when the specter of school hangs nearby daring the kids to name it, to make it real. A season when Japanese lanterns have again become de rigueur. When if, like Elizabeth Hungate, in one of her sudden and misguided fevers of trying to change her life, you've had your son drag the moldy box of Japanese lanterns from the garage out to the curb, you might curse yourself. You should have known you'd only have to buy them again. After all, everything comes back eventually. Haven't you witnessed this scene before? The sway of the little colored lanterns in the pool's unquiet surface? The drone of the air conditioner at the side of the house? The yapping dog next door? The cluster of patio chairs the adults have drawn together and abandoned like toys on the lawn while Jack flips the burgers and Marnie goes to make sure Tommy and Gabe are getting along and Frank goes inside to mix more drinks? Elizabeth has been here before. Returning from the bathroom, she's paused at the sliding back door, close enough to feel the cool radiating off it. The lightning bugs are out. Gabe floats nonchalant in the pool, fully clothed, his shorts bloated with an air bubble. He's gesturing rudely to Lacey, who's just pushed him in. Lacey she doesn't know about, but Elizabeth can see that beneath her son's merciless teasing, he is already half in love with the girl, and it hurts her with a sharpness that almost stops her breathing. Here's another hurt. Though she doesn't want to, she can feel Frank standing behind her. She wishes she could melt into the glass, become transparent too, a thing people only notice in passing. She wants to tell Gabe never to fall in love, but she won't. Besides, he always has to learn everything the hard way. Moment of clarity. What the fuck have we been doing with ourselves? Thank you. And now, as is customary, I can stand up here while you throw tomatoes or questions, one or the other. Hey, thanks for coming to talk with us today. Um, so. I guess two questions. Uh, the first one being, um, I, I just started City on Fire. I'm really digging it. But I had more opportunity to read your uh, criticism. And I really enjoyed your thoughts on Don DeLillo and David Foster Wallace and Joseph McElroy. And I was just wondering if you had ever given any thought to collecting like your essays and, and, and criticism at all. Has ever crossed your mind? Uh, it, has, it has only intermittently crossed my mind when I'm particularly hard up for cash. Um, <laughs> No, uh, it's, it's an interesting question. I actually have a shelf in my study of collections of other people's criticism. So Updike, because he was Updike and could get away with it, would do this thing of like literally publishing, republishing every little, you know, two sentence thing he'd scribbled in the calendar section of the New Yorker in these big omnibus editions. And to me, they're wonderful. Um, but I do have the sense that they have a very limited audience. <laughs> like there's maybe not that many other shelves on which all these books sit. So um, I'm not sure what the uh, commercial proposition is there. But maybe you know one day in the fullness of time, I will look back and see that these things all belong together in in a book. I noticed you were reading this book Zone yeah. um, by a French writer named uh, 
Matthias Ennard, which is written in one sentence. Yeah. And one of my favorite pieces of criticism I ever did was I tried to write a one sentence review. <laughs> It's like, you know, 1,400 words. So if you haven't seen that one, you I'll know, check that one you out. should amuse yourself with that. A, a total failure, but fun to write. Then secondly, and I'm sure this is a question you're going to get a lot, um, there's a lot more art design in Field Guide than there was even in City on Fire. I just was wondering if you could maybe speak to your involvement in that and, and working with the, the photographers and, and the illustrators. Sure. Um, so I mentioned, it's, it's, it's actually odd. I'm not a very visual person. Um, nor do I ever intend to have particular kind of design things uh, go into the books when I'm conceiving them. But um, with this and with the novel, both of them have ended up having a kind of a design element. Um, and I, I feel like I can say that's the last time that will ever happen. But, you know, apparently I don't know when I'm writing these things that that's going to happen. So this was originally written... Um, I was teaching at Beauvoir at the National Cathedral School, and um, I would I was just really kind of taken with the the little scene where the girl is is running around with the video cameras, you know, drawn fairly directly from something I witnessed. Um, I had this weird voyeuristic um, proximity to these kids' lives, like they were you know parents getting divorced, grandparents dying, those sorts of things. When you're there second grade teacher like it comes into your world and I would write these little vignettes and I, I didn't exactly have the sense that they were going together until I had this title one day and I thought oh I like that title what is that what's the book that goes with that title and I realized like oh it's the story that all of these little vignettes make and when you put them together and then I kind of thought well you know if it's going to be a field guide it would have to be illustrated um, and uh, my friend Chris Eichler, who um, is, you know, grew up in Tenleytown and is a great photographer, I had this idea that I would use all Chris's photographs. He, he did the girl in the polka dot dress, for example. Um, but he is like a miraculously slow human being, and which is what part of what makes him a good artist, but I knew that he was never going to be able to, to finish. And so I ended up kind of opening it up and recruiting other artists. So I'd go into galleries and, you know, see someone, I would just like see someone's visual sensibility and go, oh, I like that person's eye. Like, and I would, set, you know, find out what their email address was and reach out and say, hey, I'm doing this book. So I ended up with this pile of photographs, you know, that kind of reflect these different sensibilities, the way that I wanted the chapters to have these different voices. And then holding those together and making it feel coherent became almost a design challenge for the publisher. And so the, the book actually ended up kind of more designing it with, you know, these sorts of different papers and um, dog-eared corners and all of that stuff as a way of suggesting not only a field guide, but one that's been like battered and passed around and people have taped things into. And, um, and so that's where all that came from. So again, I hope like next book, like no design elements, but you know, who knows? I'm apparently not in charge. So thanks. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I love this. I, I just uh, was looking through the paper for uh, an event at uh, Politics and Prose today. I saw this and I, I went on Amazon and read the first 20 pages and I was hooked. And I loved hearing you read it. Um, oh, thank you. So I'm going to get it. And, um, I'm just fascinated with your thought process. Um, First of all, coming up with the field guide, sort of like a, a, um, a bird watcher studying the ye yellow-bellied sapsucker or something, the nesting <laughs> habits. I love that. And I'd also like to know, you mentioned Updike, and uh, the host mentioned Cheever. Who are your influences as writers? So, okay, yes. Yeah, so, so to tell, this is interesting, because it um, sort of the publication history of this book is very odd um, and, and starts to get at what you're, you're gesturing toward. Um, this was written the la right before I left DC. So it was written, I want to say like the spring of 04. Um, I had been in Washington off and on for almost 10 years at that point. And at that point I was, I was 25, I think. And the most recent three years had been the years of like anthrax, the sniper, September 11th, um, all that stuff. It was a really, I mean, I'm sure many of you remember, it was like a really weird 
time here and um and kind of like a pressure cooker and i would be walking back from beauvoir to mount pleasant and kind of writing these little things in my head and you asked about my thought process and i think the answer to that would be my my thought process then was very scattered it was it was very much like a young man's thought process um and i in a in a good way i didn't have the kind of sensibleness to think oh that field guide idea doesn't belong with these vignettes it was like everything i saw just kind of i would stick together uh, and a lot of my work from back then has this kind of quality of like being just on the edge of idea overload you know i hope it's just on the edge maybe it jumps over and it's just idea overload but um anyway so so when i look back that's what i see and then that that sort of fits together with the question of who my influences were because at that point i had these kind of like disparate chains of influence so um i was reading philip roth i was reading updike i was reading Richard Yates, John Cheever, some of these sort of suburban touchstone writers. I was also reading a lot of like, you know, French and Latin American experimental fiction. I mean, I was coming, literally coming to politics and prose and, you know, reading Julio Cortazar or reading Italo Calvino or Borges or something. And there's an element of this that is very kind of, um, for lack of a better word, and with apologies to the French friend I just met, which is very French. <laughs> this is very experimental, like, aleatory way of putting together a narrative and then I had this kind of third chain of influence which is books I loved as a kid so these choose your own adventure books and somehow I feel like I liked the way that this c concept s found a way to to mediate among those things um, I feel like often in in the arts are there you know influence and aesthetics turn into arguments like it's, you either have to be on this side or that side you know so realism you know updikean realism or borgesian you know exuberance and maybe just because of my family background i always have this urge to kind of synthesize and mediate and to say no no you know all of these things can can somehow fit together or what is the middle ground among them so i think that you know may be responsible for some of the form of the book because my way of trying to um intervene in the divorce of my parents John Updike and Gertrude Stein. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Hi. I guess I thought I also was inspi inspired to ask this question as I listened to you read. Do you um, do you have uh, anything out, or have you done much just in what you'd call poetry, or what one would might call poetry? And um, just occurs to me that because these are fairly compact in uh, overall that. You know that might be something you would do well that that was really how I started out writing and I, for a long time I assumed this was how everyone started out writing like Rousseau I think has a thing about how song game came before speech like the first um, you know the first speech act by human beings was you know to sing a song and that somehow conversation is a fallen form of song I have this idea that because this is my experience, it must be true that for all writers, you know, you start out trying to be a poet and you fail at that and then you turn to prose. Um, so like, you know, if a human being is, a, is like a more interesting but failed version of an angel, a novelist is a more, maybe more interesting but failed version of a poet. So this was actually written right around the time that I had kind of given up poetry out of a sense of failure. Um, I had started writing poetry at 13 or 14 and very, very embarrassingly bad poetry, obviously, as one does at 13 or 14. Um, and, and that had actually indirectly led to my landing in DC because uh, that's how committed I was to it. And then there was this like one week when I was 17 when suddenly the poems I was writing became real poems and I, I had one I got one week and I, th I literally I thought of myself with some hubris as America's greatest living teenage poet for that week and then and I wrote like maybe nine poems that were good and then immediately it just it just went away and like the next thing I wrote was just terrible 
So it took me four or five years to quit poetry. It was like a, you know, a failed relationship. But eventually I was just like, I'm not going to be any good. I guess I have to now write prose. So I moved to D.C. in 2001 on a permanent basis. Uh, I had been in my first adult job for like six weeks. And then September 11th happened and, you know, all hell broke loose. And in the months immediately after that, the bad prose I had been writing suddenly turned like I could feel this kind of weird quickening in it. Like, like, oh, all of a sudden, somehow this feels like real, real writer's prose. And this was one of the first things um, that I guess maybe this was maybe 18 months. So I'd written, I wrote like maybe six or seven short stories and then I wrote this. And I think the, the prose in this and in some of the stories has still a slightly poetic sense of compression that, that you can't sustain over a 400 page or in my case, 900 page novel. Like a, a novel needs a little more slack in it or your head will explode as a reader. You know, like, um, some of the Beckett novels are wonderful, but if they were 600 pages, you would kill yourself after reading them. So I think I was still learning, you know, how to build slack into the prose. And what another thing the form allowed me to do is to just cut out all the slack and just leave the kind of poetic compression on the page. So um, this August, my wife gave me a 70th birthday party at our house in France, which we call the Money Pit. Um, and um, what's French for the money pit? <laughs> Gouf d'argent. <laughs> Gouf d'argent. And uh, we have this friend out there. Well, I have a friend. Faith doesn't like him that much. Um, who has decided one of his missions in life is to teach me about real art in America, which real Americans don't know about. They miss it. And for years, he made me sit through Jim Jarmusch movies, which actually I hadn't ever seen or even heard of some of them. And then for my birthday present, he gave me a French translation of this book, not knowing that the previous book sort of began in our apartment and that um, uh, I could have read it in English if I had known of its existence. So my question is, why was there a French translation so early in the game? And what do the French, how do they react to it differently than we do? So the, the publication history that I alluded to earlier was that after I moved to New York, this was actually published in English in 2007, I think, um, but by a very small art book press. Um, so the edition was, excuse me, maybe 2,500 copies were printed, in part because, you know, it's very hard to produce this in a kind of mass way because just the, f the photo reproduction and the paper and all of that is complicated. So this book had been out there, th all 2,500 copies of it, at the time when the novel came out. But, um, and I want to believe there's not a causal connection here, but the, the publisher had gone bankrupt. Um, so, you know, the fact that, <laughs> what was it, uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc? You know, the, I the idea that this was um, published and then subsequently the, the publisher went bankrupt, I'd like to think that that's not a direct causal link, but who knows. But um, so when the novel came out, you could kind of go maybe on eBay and find a copy of this in the original hardcover. You know, I, maybe it was $3 or maybe it was $40. I really don't know. Um, and, and honestly, who knows where the royalties went? Like certainly not to me. So my, uh, and it had been published in German as well, because of course, why, you know, the Germans. Um, but uh, so when my, my American publisher and my English publisher said, we want to bring this out a couple of years after the novel, um, can you go to all the photographers and like secure the rights? And that, that was a whole nightmare. But the French publisher, because the novel had been a very big deal in France, they were like, we're going to, we're going to, they published the translation even before the, this American edition came out. So uh, I think maybe just to cash in or something. But uh, there is something to what you say about the French concept of American culture. I went to something called the Festival, Festival of the Americas outside of Paris last year. And it, for them, it is like the giants of American literature. And it like, doesn't map at all exactly onto what our 
concept of that is. So James Elroy is like a big best-selling novelist here, but James Elroy is like a god in France. You know, it's, it was just all, all, the t all this talk of Elroy. And then I discovered some novelists who are wonderful, who I had never, I, you know, and I make it my business note, I had never heard of uh, here in the States, but who have first acquired a following in France. So I do love that, you know, kind of the fact that there's a second America out there somewhere, which is America as seen from France. And I like to think that, like, you know, in that second America, um, you know, James Elroy is president. <laughs> no, they, that's, that's very true. I had a college classmate who's sort of well-known, but not that well-known. Every, it's one in five Americans has ever heard of him. I've never met a French person who's not Paul Auster, never heard of anyone that hasn't. I mean, they sell it in this store, but I don't know where else in Washington you can find stuff. But, uh, so, yeah, they know America better than we do, but then again, France kind of invented America. And continues to invent America, apparently. <laughs> you mentioned some of the really weird stuff that Washington has gone through in the last 15 years. And I was wondering how you came to choose the New York blackout as the focus for City on Fire, and whether you're thinking about writing another big, great American novel about any of the weird things that have happened in Washington? So the, the way that fiction works, as near as I can tell, and um, y you almost have to be careful as a writer in n understanding too well how fiction works, because I, I do think there's something that dies a little bit if you think you, you've, you've solved the puzzle. But as near as I can tell, there's something about masks and costumes and imposture and play and kind of concealing from yourself a little bit what you know really well so that you can encounter it afresh or anew. So in, I actually feel like the, you know, the blackout in the, the novel is in many ways a kind of, you know, in many ways it is September 11th. Um, it, it's hard for me to explain that, but just that experience, you know, I was working in the Watergate building at that point. So I, my response to September 11th was to quit my job and go teach at Beauvoir. But at the time I was working in an office shop in the Watergate and like, you know, my desk looked out on the Saudi embassy and we were, you know, uh, and it was kind of a media nerve center at a time when you weren't carrying that in your pocket. And I mean, we watched the whole thing live until the point at which we got evacuated. And I mean, except for the screaming black Secret Service suburbans, like, the, you know, the city was just utterly transformed. There's no traffic, you know, fighter jets going overhead, people looking up at the sound of planes, um, and then and this weird silence, I remember, you know, thousands and thousands of people walking, you know, up New Hampshire Avenue. Um, and I could not, if I wrote that, it would, you know, it would be nonfiction and it would, die somehow a little on the page because I would, I would know too well what I was trying to get at. But somehow that experience kind of like stayed with me and came out a lot in, in, the, in uh, the novel. And for this, actually, a lot of the hysterical um, feeling of, you know, Washington circa, you know, 2003, February of 2003, maybe, I guess, was this when the sniper was caught. I can't quite really remember, but... October 2002. October 2002. But a lot, a lot of that, f you know, that feeling was part of what dialed up the colors on these things I was observing at the school. Because, remember, the sniper was shooting s school kids as well as other people. And so everything just jumps out at you, you know, in this kind of relief because, you know, who knows what tomorrow holds. So I guess, you know, as a writer, I'm always chasing those things that throw the everyday into, into that kind of heightened relief, you know, apprehending things the way that you might if you knew you were going to die tomorrow. And that's, in a lot of ways, what reading fiction feels like to me. I've discovered a wonderful Canadian writer named Mavis Gallant, who writes short stories, um, many of them set in Paris or around Paris. And 
I was just reading her an hour ago, and it's, you read this paragraph, and it's like chiseling in, you know, indelibly into your forebrain, you know, some just the experience of someone sitting and having a cup of coffee that ordinarily you just pass right over. So maybe that's like a, a goal for me somehow. Thank you. Um, I think we can proceed with the signing. Uh, thank you, Corey. So let's give him a round of applause. Thanks.